fact is that politically and ideologically and militarily and even economically, the European Union is very much under the thumb of the global imperial uh, power. I mean, so much so that when uh, the Euro elite was offering a very pitiful sum of money to the Greeks, not even this government, but the previous government, Tim Geithner, the Secretary of the Treasury, had to intervene and said, look, this is ridiculous. You've got to give them at least 500 billion. They were offering 50. And at first they hummed and hawed, and finally they said, you're right, and did what the Americans wanted. So all the hopes that had been aroused in Europe from the time the European idea was first mooted of having an independent Europe, at that time they used to say independent of the big powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, charting its own way in the world, which was certainly the aim of de Gaulle and others that followed. Uh, but that Europe disappeared once the Cold War ended. It, when you would have felt it could actually become that, since there was no enemy in that sense of the world, that particular Europe was effectively made into a, a banker's Europe, a Europe of money, a Europe of without a, a social uh, vision, uh, which it could easily have had, and challenged uh, the neoliberal order. But they couldn't do it. And many of them didn't want to do it. And the result is now a huge European crisis. I mean, the latest report from the McKinsey Global Institute, which the Financial Times highlighted, on its front page yesterday, shows that since the 2008 crash, which should have been a wake-up call for the Europeans, actually the debt has mounted. The whole world is now in debt, including countries like China, which weren't previously to that extent indebted. And so uh, a crash, another crash and a recession is very possible is the logic of this. So punishing the Greeks to the extent that they are being punished for being in debt when they are far from the only ones suffering this condition is really appalling. And what it shows is that the punishment of the Greeks is not because they are in debt, because the right-wing government that Syriza defeated could only push through, I think, three of the 14 reforms demanded by the EU. The lives of ordinary people have been miserable, absolutely miserable. And we've been watching it, those of us who go to that country a great deal, like me, I do, uh, have been watching it and have been seeing very little of this actually reported on the media, in the media of the, of the European uh, uh, community the EU press, the actual detailed account of what people have been going through. So at last they elect a government which offers to change things, like the South Americans did, and very influenced by the South Americans, both in Greece and in Spain, Podemos. And they're told no. They are frightened now for domino effect that if the Greeks are rewarded for having done this, other countries might do the same. So crush them. <clears throat> so while the Greeks can't be kicked out of the European Union, that is not permitted by the Constitution, unless it's amended. They can't even be kicked out of the Eurozone. That is not possible. But life can be makes, made so difficult for them that in order to serve the needs of the people who they promised to protect, which is why they've been voted into power, they might have to leave the euro and set up a, a euro Greece, a Greek euro or a euro drachma, 
or a currency, a temporary currency, so that the country keeps on moving. At the same time, arguing their positions in all the European Union institutions from which they cannot be excluded. But it's a difficult one, this. Because temporarily, were that to happen, conditions would get worse. There's no doubt about that, which is why the Greek government is resisting it. But they might have to go down that route, and at, the, at least they're telling the people everything. Every single day at press conferences, they're saying, this is what we've been asked to do, <clears throat> this is what you elected us not to do. And the choices are very difficult, either to capitulate to the EU, <coughs> in which case there'll be a wave of revulsion against the left in Greece, and people will say, so you're just like all the others. And the danger now here is not that something more to the left will emerge, but people could shift in this volatile atmosphere very, very rapidly to the right. And the Golden Dawn is an, not just a neo-Nazi group, it's an explicitly fascist group which parades the swastika and marks Hitler's birthdays and whatever else, and is violent, carried out pogrom of immigrants in Athens and other cities. So that is the scale of the problem. And for the Euro elite to behave as it's doing, as the extreme center, in other words, is very short-sighted and very foolish. If we come now to the third big development in the world this century and the last years, last decades of the previous century, it's been the rise of China. Um, I, I remember I was once uh, speaking and uh, giving a lecture in the States and some old veteran from the labor movement said to me, but comrade, what has happened to the American working class? And I said, it's all in China now because they're producing the bulk of the goods that you need and you require. And this is all true. But again, to discourage any notions that China is about to replace the United States, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, point out that there's nothing, you know, it's not even remotely close to doing all the figures now produced by economists, scholarly economists and others, show that on where it counts, what they call the uh, millionaire households and system integrators, it means the dominant sections of the economy, the Chinese are still way behind. I mean, if you look at national shares of world millionaire households in 2012, America, United States, 42.5%, China, 9.4%. So in terms of economic strength, even though the United States suffers occasionally, where it matters, uh, they are still doing well, the American economy, and in most of the crucial markets for the production of spare parts for aero aeroplanes, for key computer systems, pharmaceuticals, medical equipment, the United States dominant, and together with Europe produces 80% of these system integrators. The Chinese are nowhere, or, you know, on a very tiny percentage on that front. The figures in 2010 showed us that three quarters of China's top 200 exporting companies, and these are Chinese statistics, three quarters of them are foreign owned. They're not even owned by the Chinese millionaires or by the Chinese state directly, there's a lot of foreign investment, often from neighboring countries, Taiwan for instance. <coughs> the Chinese company that produces a lot of computers for Apple, but yet Apple makes the dominant profits, the Chinese profits are very low, and even 
higher than the actual Chinese profits are the profits of those who actually control and own these companies, which is a company in Taiwan, tiny little island. So this somehow automatic notion that the Chinese, because they are doing much better than before, are going to suddenly rise to power and replace the United States is really a lot of baloney. I don't believe it militarily, I don't believe it economically, and politically, ide ideologically. Uh, it's obvious that that is not the case. But prior to the First World War, there was a lot of triumphalism. And uh, the English colonial geographer, Mackinder, coined a ditty, which was basically designed for German and English years, to show the Germans we have an empire and you don't. And the ditty went like this. Who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland <coughs> commands the world island. Britain. Who rules the world island commands the world. And there was, of course, a strong element of truth in that which was the reason, in my opinion, the basic reason for both the First and the Second World War, that this new country built by Bismarck said, we are a major power in Europe, but how come France and Britain have more parts of the world than we do? And so the First World War was a war fought for colonies and imperial conquest. And the, of course, the, the, the triumph of the Russian revolutionaries they paid a lot of attention to this, what was happening in the world, who was <coughs> going to succeed. And both Lenin and Trotsky, the most capable leaders of that revolution, said the British are going down. It's obvious. And the Americans are the future power, and we have to think about that. And in fact, there's a wonderful speech in 1924 at a conference to discuss the world economy, the section to discuss the world economy at the <coughs> Communist International, uh, where Trotsky, uh, in his inimitable fashion, made the following pronouncement. Their English bourgeois character has been molded in the course of centuries. Class self-esteem has entered into their blood and bones it will be much harder to knock the self-confidence of world rulers out of them. But the American will knock it out just the same when he gets seriously down to business. In vain does the British bourgeois console himself that he will serve as a guide for the inexperienced American. <laughs> yes, there will be a transitional period. But the crux of the matter does not lie in the habits of diplomatic leadership, but in actual power, existing capital, and industry. And the United States, if we take its economy from oats to big battleships of the <coughs> latest type, occupies the first place. They produce all the living necessities to the extent of one half to two thirds of what is produced by all mankind. And of course, this prediction, which now seems banal, uh, proved to be absolutely right. But the reason I read it out to you is to say that let's put, ch if we were to change this language, and instead of the British English bourgeois character, say the American bourgeois character has now been molded in the course of centuries, etc., etc., but the Chinese will knock it out just the same when they get seriously down to business. Just doesn't make sense. Not just culturally or you know, linguistically, it doesn't make sense economically or politically, even though a lot of the world's actual consumer goods on a lower scale are produced in China. Militarily, they are way behind the United <coughs> States, and so they should be. It's very foolish when I hear some people say, oh, we want more inter-imperial contradiction and more inter-imperial wars, and the ones who are cheering on Putin to take on the United States. It's just foolish, and it doesn't make sense. 
because they can't do it. And why do we want more wars anyway? We have to devise a, 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 a strategy to end them. Not easy, but that has uh, uh, got something we, we, we have to strive towards. Um, where are we going to end up at the end of this century? It's a very difficult one. Mm, a very, very difficult one. Where is China going to be? Will China remain united? Uh, is Western democracy going to flourish? All the indications are that neither is going to be the case. I don't think China is going to break up. The one thing the Chinese will defend is their borders and their sovereignty. But the problem about having a single imperial power in the world for its allies, not its rivals, is that it is the only sovereign power. And it decides and determines what this sovereignty is, uh, is going to be. I mean, there are many things happening in the world today which one can note. They're not of the sort that are going to be permanent because they're not strong enough to be permanent. The South Americans are not strong enough to resist the full might of the United States. And attempts being made today by Washington to destabilize the Venezuelan regime yet again, mainly, not because they feel it's a threat, but because it's got oil. And they've attacked their oil-producing rivals by lowering the, uh, by increasing <coughs> the production of Saudi oil, which is a clever way to go. At one go, then, you uh, cut down Putin to size in the way of Washington's thinking, reduce Venezuela's income, because a large amount of the oil money was being spent for social services, education, health, etc., 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 and Iran, which supplies China <clears throat> with oil, but China is also supplied by Saudi Arabia, so it doesn't affect China to that uh, extent. So, as always, the question remains, what is to be done? <coughs> what is going to happen? I mean, you have to look, look at different ways of running countries and running the world. And interestingly enough, one of the more creative thinkers today is uh, the German sociologist Wolfgang Strick, who I hope will give a lecture to you one of these days. I mean, he has lectured at the LSE in places, pointing out that what is happening is a ferocious attack on democracy and that a serious alternative European Union structure is desperately needed because this one is not working. And that structure will necessitate democracy and more democracy on every level. A provincial level, a city level, as well as a national level, and then a European level. And he argues that the one thing that cannot be said by anyone who wants to be taken seriously is that the European Union itself, as constructed, is a democratic institution. It isn't. It never has been. So unless there is a concerted effort by people who want the world to advance forward, not to regress, activity uh, is absolutely vital. And that has been the big thing in Europe, in my opinion, from Greece and from Spain. And it could spread. That people believing that to start with, let us find an alternative to the neoliberal system. Without going beyond that at the moment, to just try and get people back on an even footing. And that hasn't happened. And also, with this uh, uh, vacuum, you've had a, a turn to religion in the West. I mean, similar reasons in Poland, when the Poles were struggling to uh, create a trade union called Solidarity, and many got very excited by this fact, including me, I admit, but very few noticed uh, 
that one of the first things Lech Walesa did was go on his knees and kiss the hands of the <coughs> Polish cardinal who later became the Pope. What existed in Eastern Europe, not to mention the Soviet Union, were regimes I call social dictatorships, especially after the reforms, you know, after the end of Stalinism proper, after the <coughs> Khrushchev revelations. These were essentially weak regimes with a social structure, a political structure which was authoritarian, but with an economic structure that offered people more or less the same things they were offered under uh, Swedish or British social democracy, but they were dictatorships. Now, with the collapse of these old regimes in Eastern Europe, the figures are very interesting. In Eastern Germany today, a poll taken three weeks ago, quite astonishing, 82% of the people in the eastern part of Germany say life was better for us before. And when they ask to specify, they say more community, more facilities, money wasn't the dominant thing. It's not that they are starving or anything, far from it. Cultural, cultural life was better. And they said and we were not treated like second-class citizens, as we still are because we are from the East. And this became a serious problem in Germany. So serious that in the second year after the reunification, Helmut Schmidt, the former German chancellor, and by no means a great radical, addressing the Social Democratic Party conference in Germany, said to them, I want to tell you one thing. The way we are treating the East Germans as if they were pariahs is completely wrong. If you want, there are more pariahs here descended from we know who, who were kept. But he said, if you ask me, but he said, whatever else you do, do not underestimate the culture produced in that part of, East, of Germany. And he said, to the shock of quite a lot of the delegates. If I had to choose a plinth, <coughs> three plinths on which I would place the three great people of German culture, it would be Goethe, Heine, and Brecht. There was a gasp when he said Brecht, because he said he was a very fine lyrical poet. So it's not that the West Germans didn't know and that some of them didn't try, but it didn't work. <laughs> because by this time, the whole culture in Germany has preserved cultural traditions better, in my opinion, than any other European country, by the way, in the amount spent on the arts and culture. And interestingly enough, in terms of the largest number of non, not non, just non-religious people, on the atheism charts, what is the top country? It is um, Eastern Germany. 52.1% of Eastern Germans say, I don't believe in God. The Czech Republic is second with 39.9%. And dear, beloved, lovely, secular France, it's only 23.3%. So secularism in France really does mean anything that's not Islamic. <laughs> uh, and if you go on the other side, the percentage which reveals, I know God really exists and I have no doubts about it. Highest is the Philippines, 83.6%. Chile, 79.4%, Israel, 65.5%, Poland, 62%, the United States, 60.6%, compared to which Ireland is a bastion of moderation, only 43.2%, <laughs> etc., etc. So religion is not simply confined to one part of the world or the other, since the 90s, it's, I mean, in the United States it was always very strong. 
uh, the, the, what they don't give in these figures is that while 60.6 believe that God really exists, over 80% believe that angels exist. <laughs> So the mystery is the 20% who believe angels exist, but not God. <coughs> so um, religion is going to play a role unless something else emerges. So far it hasn't, and religion has survived for you know, over 2,000 years or 3,000 in the case of or more in the case of Judaism, 2,000 plus for Christianity, 1,000 and a half for Islam, the Roma not tend to be too religious, have been in Europe for a thousand years plus, still aren't recognized as Europeans. So it's a, it's a mixed and confused world. Something which shows that problems don't change, they take new forms, that in Sparta, in the second century before the Christian era, a huge fissure developed between the ruling elite and ordinary people following the Peloponnesian Wars. And those who were ruled and not the rulers demanded a change because the gap between rich and poor in Sparta had become so huge that it couldn't be tolerated by people. It did remind me of Greece, actually, when I reread this this morning. And so a triumvirate of three radical monarchs, because that's all there was at the time, Agis IV, Cleomenes III, and Nabis, created a structure to help revive the state on a new basis. Nobles were sent packing into exile. The dictatorship of magistrates was abolished. Slaves were given their freedom. All citizens were allowed to vote, and land confiscated from the rich were distributed to the poor. Something, of course, the ECB wouldn't tolerate today. <laughs> and the early Roman Republic, <coughs> threatened by this example, sent its legions under Quinus Flaminius to crush Sparta, because of the example they were offering the rest of the Mediterranean world. According to the great Roman historian of antiquity, Livy, Nabis, the king of Sparta, responded. When you read these words, you feel two things, both the cold anger and the dignity. And he tells the Romans, Nabis, do not demand that Sparta <coughs> conform to your own laws and institutions. You select your cavalry and infantry by their property qualifications and desire that a few should excel in wealth and the common people be subject to them. Our lawgiver did not want the state to be in the hands of a few whom you call the Senate, nor that any one class should have supremacy <coughs> in the state. He believed that by equality of fortune and dignity, there would be many to bear arms for their country. And on that optimistic note, from Antique Lands, thank you very much.